What makes an innocent person confess to a crime they did not commit? It's a baffling thought and one that's explored in an increasingly celebrated new American podcast about false confessions. The series is called Wrongful Conviction, False Confessions, and it is riveting. It takes us inside police interrogations and it examines the factors that combine to make people confess to crimes they didn't commit. We have our own experience, of course, of this with Tana Porter, a shameful episode in our own criminal history. The podcast looks at it. We're really delighted to welcome from Chicago one of the podcasts hosts, Defence Attorney Professor Laura Nyrider, whose uh, work exonerating the wrongfully convicted has been truly important and invariably against immense odds. Professor Nyrider, do you mind if I call you Laura? It's so good to uh, have you with us and we're really grateful for your time and the remarkable work you do. And I want to begin with a question that is really hard to answer, but why do people confess to crimes they haven't committed? Well, thanks so much for having me, John. That's exactly the, the right question to ask. Why would anyone confess to a crime they didn't commit? Well, the answer has everything to do with the interrogation techniques that yeah. are used inside the interrogation room, techniques that turn the world on its head so that suddenly it starts making sense to the person being interrogated that they should confess to a crime they didn't commit. On our podcast, we tell stories of people who are told they'll get the death penalty unless they confess, in which case they'll be able to walk free. You see this over and over and over again, and it's time the world heard these stories. Uh, uh, on your podcast, you play interrogations. I mean, we hear interrogations, and they are staggering. And they are, they are an affront to the notion that justice is too wide and a level playing field. And, and invariably, the odds are stacked against these people in every way, aren't they? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You know, Interrogations only began to be recorded in the United States in the last 10 years or so. So all of a sudden we have this brand yeah. new glimpse inside the interrogation room. And that's what our podcast covers, this unequal playing field between these interrogators who are allowed to do things like lie about the evidence to unsuspecting folks who feel themselves just being dug deeper and deeper into a hole until confession is the only way out. It's a desperate form of, uh, of, of, of vulnerability that these people have. And if I look at the, on your CV, mm. your selected litigation, uh, Dacey versus Dittman, which is, of course, f very famous because of the Netflix series Making of a Murderer. But if we go on State versus Anderson, yeah. uh, People versus Taylor, there's just case after case of wrongfully convicted people. And were it not for people like you, they would still be in jail. And in some cases, of course, they still are. Well, that's that's really kind of you. I mean, they're the heroes, right? They're the survivors, the people who fight and inspire all of us to keep fighting for them. Brendan Dassey, my client, his story touched millions around the globe when it was, you know, a spotlight was shown on it on, through the Netflix series Making a Murderer. Uh, we hope to do the same thing with this podcast. You know, the problem of false confessions is not just a Brendan Dassey problem. No. It's not just a Manitowoc, Wisconsin problem. It's not just a U.S. problem. It happens all around the globe, Absolutely. including, as you said, in the case of Tana Pora here in New Zealand. At what stage also is there terrible cynicism by, by, by the criminal justice system who are able to say, case closed, conviction obtained, and, and despite overwhelming evidence, and in America you see this go up to the level of governor, you see it go up to the Supreme Court, despite overwhelming evidence that the conviction was wrong and it was obtained on terms that were wrong, it seems like too much effort. To, to, to address it and to respond to the wrongfulness of what's happened? I think that's right. You know, I, part of what we are trying to do at the Center on Wrongful Convictions, part of what we're trying to do with this podcast is change the way people think about these cases, right? A big part of our task is simply to shine a spotlight to open people's minds to the possibility that false confessions happen way more often than we think they do. We know of hundreds of cases just like Brendan, just like Tana. Mm. And if we can begin shining more and more spotlights, opening minds, that's when legal changes will start to happen. Those are reforms that we fight for at our center. Center, reforms like recording inside the interrogation room, lawyers for vulnerable people like Brendan and Tana. Um, those are the kinds of things we need to make sure this doesn't happen again. And, and if the lawyer is an overworked public defender and, and pr prima facie you have a confession, it's hard, hard work, isn't it, to defend somebody in that position? It's very hard work, you know? I mean, for the first 10 years I did this work, I spent my time trying to convince anyone that false confessions happened. It's such a counterintuitive idea. And then, thank goodness, making a murderer was made and, and people saw it they happen understand to Brendan it now. They absolutely and saw understand just how it. easily 
And all of a sudden, there's this shift. People, people get it, right? People see it happen. They saw it happen to Brendan. They saw it happen to Tana. Um, and that's, again, what we're trying to do in this podcast, to say this happens all the time. We know of hundreds of cases like this. And that surely that number is just the tip of the iceberg. It's, it's really shocking. And I want to ask you two questions. One is about what the bench should be doing. How important is instruction from the bench to the judge? So the judge speaking to the jury directly about the fact that this is possible and about the circumstances in which the uh, uh, confession was obtained. Is it important that that starts to happen? It's important that those kinds of messages are sent, certainly you know, by, by judges and the judiciary. Yes, absolutely. But awareness has got to start way before that. We work closely with law enforcement officers because we've got to start reforming the way interrogations happen yeah. inside the room, inside the box, so that false confessions don't happen in the first place. There's reform all across the spectrum that needs to happen. You know, we're just uh, proud to be part of the effort to get it done. Yeah, well, you do stunning work. In a country in which some states still have and use the death penalty, Boy, it's important. Yeah. I, I, I mean, setting aside yeah. any personal opposition to the death penalty, if it exists, it's really important that there are no innocent people sitting on death row, right? Well, that's exactly right. I mean, here in my home state of Illinois, our center exonerated six people off our death row, which caused our state to abolish the death penalty simply because we couldn't be sure that the people that we were executing were actually guilty. And actually, one thing that's interesting in this podcast that people will hear is the threat of the death penalty is used over and over, over and, and over, over again, again in cases across the country to get false confessions. So, 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 so there is a, a, an almost a sentencing bargaining taking place at, at the stage in which the interrogation exactly. is seeking to obtain a confession. And so the sentencing bargaining says, if you're convicted without confessing, you'll get the death penalty. If you confess now, you will just do jail time. Right, or, or, or more than that, you know, people will want to help you, you'll be okay. You'll have nothing to worry about. That's what they told Brendan Dassey. Yeah, they That's did. what they told a lot of people whose stories we tell. It's absolutely wonderful that you have done this work and there are, I mean, you know, the Centre on Wrongful Conviction, CWC, launched in April 1999, has made a material difference to justice and our assessment of it in the United States. So congratulations on everything you've done. The uh, podcast is called Wrongful Conviction, False Confessions. Uh, Professor Laura Nairata, congratulations on all your work and your podcast is highly recommended by yours truly. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, John. It's been an honour. <laughs>